My name is Sarah Bush, and I was a sophomore. I was 16 years old at Columbine. My name is Lara Hall. I was Lara Green, but I was 14. I was a freshman at um, Columbine. I was at lunch and just eating lunch with a few friends, and everybody kind of just a big wave got of people got under their tables, under the lunch tables, and then a janitor ran by and kind of yelled, run, and we didn't really know what we were running from, but we, um, I decided to go run upstairs, just kind of in the chaos of not knowing where to go, and ran upstairs and eventually found a friend, and we decided to go into the choir room to tell her sister that they needed to get out, and her sister didn't end up being in there, but we found ourselves barricaded in a choir room closet that was very small, filled with a lot of people, and kind of just waited in there until um, the SWAT team came four and a half hours later. One person had a cell phone and decided to call the police, and the police said, you need to turn off your cell phone. Um, we don't know who's in there or what they're tracking or what's happening, so turn it off. And I remember after that, they decided to make one last call and call their parents and tell them goodbye, basically. We were eventually rescued by the SWAT team and taken out a different door and um, went through the auditorium and out the cafeteria, which is actually where the shooters began. And um, there was water from all the sprinklers and floating backpacks and food and um, walked out the door that they came in, the glass was shot out. It truly looked like a crime scene and had to walk over um, a couple of bodies, The I think the first ones that they hit and got taken out by a police car to, there were two different meeting places and um, I ended up going to the elementary school where I waited several hours for Sarah and my mom and grandpa to come and get me. I was a sophomore in math class and we had a big math test scheduled for that day. And I think it was just a few minutes into the period when we, um, everything was quiet. We were, you know, doing our test and I heard, we all heard several large explosions and we kind of looked around at each other like, I wonder what that is. Probably just, you know, some science experiments or a senior prank or something. It was the end of the year, you know. And um, we got back to work and a few minutes later, maybe not minutes, maybe it was seconds. Um, that time timeline gets a little bit blurry, but our um, school baseball coach, Coach Ortiz, came down the hallway and I think he was entering each classroom. He got to ours and he opened the door and he said, you've got to get the hell out. There's somebody shooting. Somebody has a gun and they're shooting. And so we stood up and we ran. And I think, you know, I don't even know if everybody got out with me, but I know that I got out through that door and I ran down the hallway. And I'm not even sure how I knew which direction to run. I just instinctively ran out towards the east side of the school, which happened to be the right way, and um, got out onto this very busy road. And we were probably some of the first students out of the school. And, you know, the community had no idea what was going on yet. And we, we ran across the street, and these cars were stopping and honking at us, like, why are these silly high schoolers trying to cross the road? You know, they're not even stopping. And we ran into this field across the street, and we, we were out there for probably five minutes or so when we heard gunfire exchanging with the SWAT team that had come to the front of the school. And they were exchanging gunfire with, I assume, the assailants from the inside of the office area. And at that point, it was complete chaos, and we ran. We ran every way into the neighborhood surrounding this park and we 
I'm not sure how we ended up in somebody's house, but we did. And this person was, I don't think even had students at the high school, but they were so lovely and kind enough to let us kind of hunker down in their house. And there were probably 15 of us sitting there on the couch watching the news that had finally gotten wind of the story. And we couldn't believe what was going on. And at that point, they decided that we should probably gather at the elementary school that was nearby. So this lady piled us all into her minivan, and we drove to the school where it happened to be one of the, the meeting points. And we stood up on the stage, and we waited while they called our names to see if our parents had shown up. Nobody had cell phones in that day. Maybe a few of the parents did. And so it was like you were being auctioned off almost. It felt really um, surreal. It was just a really bizarre unorganized, chaotic moment. Um, and I think somehow at some point I was able to connect with my grandpa and he ended up at that school and we had to walk a mile back to the library where we kind of talked maybe very briefly about what we understood was going on. And when we got to the, the public library, which was another meeting point, we were standing outside the doors and I could see my mom inside who I had not talked to yet. And they would not let me get into the library to see her. And at that point I just burst through the doors. I didn't even care about what they were, what kind of order they were trying to establish. I went in and I hugged my mom and we cried and we sat and we watched these lists come in of the survivors that had been evacuated from the school. And we waited and waited for Lara's name to show up on one of those lists. And we were getting to the point where we were feeling pretty desperate for some good news. It had been hours. Um, and finally, about four and a half to five hours later, we got word that she had been evacuated and was waiting for us at the other elementary school. And we were able to drive over there and <clears throat> pick her up. And um, she was a mess and I was a mess. And, you know, everybody was just completely distraught. I mean, there was no... There was nothing to measure it against. There was no comparison. There was no, um, it was just unimaginable that this could be happening to us. That night and many, many, many nights after I slept in my mom's bed and my dad was actually out of town. He was in Washington state, Mon no, Montana, one or, one or the other, but he was gone and um, I was permanently scared and scarred both. And um, the next few days, we I think we met at the church um, many times just as a gathering place for people to be supportive and to be together. And I remember sitting in, you know, a circle of people kind of sharing their experience and I guess I guess maybe it was helpful just to hear what that other people had, you know, a horrific experience as well and to be together. The community really came together and um we met often at Clement Park. There was just a lot of gathering. There was a lot of support and I think my mom took several weeks off of work and was just there. She was just available. And looking back, I wish I spent more time with her. We were kind of, we would kind of gather with friends. I think that was a, a big help. But we didn't go back to school for about three weeks, where we ended up going to our rival school, Chatfield. And those days in school were not really school. It wasn't, I don't remember in any of my classes learning math or English or it really was just to fill the hours that we needed to complete that year of school but it was it was a 
a healing time, I think, for everybody to be together. So what I remember was that we spent a lot of time um, distracting ourselves, I think, from what reality we were in. Um, And maybe I think it was beneficial at the time. I don't think that it was um, the wrong thing to do by any means. It definitely took a weight off of us. Um, I don't think it was time to process the things that we had been through. So it was really helpful for me to be able to be with my friends and to be together without saying anything about it. But we knew that we had all experienced this horribly traumatic thing. We did service projects together. We focused on other people's needs as much as we could. Uh, We did um, these group counseling sessions that maybe weren't the most helpful, but nonetheless an opportunity for us to be together and um, I remember just spending hours and hours together at this at our local church and just not saying anything of weight um, Mm -hmm. but but being together trying Um, to mask what happened with being happy trying to try and have good moments as much as we could because I think once we went home the reality hit more and it was quiet and which is why I slept either in her room or my parents room and I was 14 when it happened and I did that all four years of high school I slept I would I would say 70 percent of the time I slept with her or my parents up until I was 17 so I think she's right I think we could distract our minds temporarily and then when it got dark or you know whatever happened to bring that fear back um, that's when it got hard and scary a really big moment was when we decided to go back to Columbine for our the next year continuing at that school uh, making the decision that we weren't going to let them win um and that we would continue for the rest of our high school education at Columbine. That was a big moment for me when we walked through the lined up parents outside the school on the first day of my junior year, and they cheered for us, and we all wore our We Are Columbine t-shirts, and we carried our new backpacks, and, you know, anything that could be fresh and new and... uh uplifting they did their best to provide that for us so that was a big turning point for me just in acknowledging that I could move forward and that I could attempt to tackle this fear and the you know that we could move on in some some way I don't know at what point during that high school career that we had I decided that I was going to be a positive person but that's really the one thing that I feel I can attribute to this. Just knowing that I could look for the positive things and look for the opportunities to count my blessings or to you know, be grateful for my family or be grateful for each day that I had. Um, but that was another big turning point for me when I made that decision. And of course, healing still happens and we've gathered friends throughout the years together each on each anniversary and Laura and I have each year gotten a little stronger as we've made at a point to make April 20th a good day and we'll get together and we'll have spa day or we'll go shopping or we'll just make it a point to touch base with each other if we can't be together and you know are pretty much in constant contact on those days and that's been a huge source of strength and healing for us just to be together. Yeah, I echo what she said about going back. I um, did not want to do that. I begged and begged my mom to let me go to a different school. I can still envision it in my head. I was ready to go to Littleton High School or even Chatfield. I just was not going back. And she said that, like Sarah said, she wasn't going to let them win and that this was something that we needed to do and we needed to go back and 
that it would make us stronger. And I remember that the first, the first time that gave me a little bit of courage and probably a lot of fear also was going back to get our backpacks. So this was in the summer, <clears throat> probably June or July, and we had to go back and just pick up our belongings since we hadn't been back to Columbine since that day. And I went and we walked in and they did not prepare the school um, in a way that you would hope. They didn't, I mean, the lockers were boarded up. It, it still looked like a crime scene. So that was really hard, but it, you know, I held Sarah's hand and I held my mom's hand and we did it. And I went and got my backpack, which was floating in water for who knows how long. All my notebooks were, you know, soaked, dried at that point, but they had all grown like this and had the wavy paper. But I think that was a big moment. Um, I think going back, like she said, the first day of school and they really made that um, a happy a, a happy day and although it was hard and scary and um, I've always said that the day I graduated high school was one of the best days of my life because I never had to go back I never had to go back to that place and that was another big moment where I, I felt like I conquered something I think I cried like <laughs> alligator tears yeah. in the hallway we rushed the halls and I was bawling and I didn't realize that it was that big of a deal to me yeah. until I I'm until in the hallway with this done. throng of seniors and I was just bawling because I was so relieved yeah it was it a was huge done. I think a big accomplishment to mm -hmm. finish because the years after were not great the year I mean the years after the shooting were hard there were murders there were suicides there were bomb threats there were it wasn't like a smooth sailing remainder of high school. A couple other life-changing healing moments for me were um, I decided to serve a mission for my church, for the LDS Church, and had really not tackled any of this post-traumatic stress or depression that I had. I didn't. I guess I didn't realize how bad it was. Um, so I ended up coming home early from that due to having um, to see several doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, I think everything just came back to haunt me. I left my family, which was my my comfort and my, my safe place. And I um, came home and realized after them putting me on five different medications and, you know, having to meet drive hours to meet with these doctors, went home and realized I needed to do something. I needed to take care of it. And um, I ended up moving to Utah and lived with Sarah, but I found um, a bishop. I think I moved out after a few months living with Sarah. And I, a bishop of my ward in the church was a counselor at BYU. And I went in one day and just kind of um, unleashed everything and needed help. I needed direction. And he said, well, my partner at school um, that teaches there, he is, this is what he deals with. He, he counsels people who have been traumatized and um, who have gone through horrific experiences. And so I went to him and it was the first time that I had been to counseling where I knew that it was right. I found the right person. I um, knew that he could help me. And I see it as no coincidence that we found each other. And, first, and this was like six years later. Yeah, this was, I mean, I was... It was a good time later. I was probably 21 at that, 21 or 22 mm -hmm. before I had actually um, decided that I needed that kind of help. And it was several months working with him. And at one point I remember he, he, I was, I think I was fired up about something. I think I was mad about something not having to do with that, but I went in and I kind of told him everything that I was feeling. And he's like, well, you seem like you're in a mood to conquer something. And I'm like, great. What do you have in mind? And he had found footage from the school of the shooters and 
Um, he's like, this is something that we need to, to hurdle over. And so he had me watch it, which is not something that I would have ever done on my own. But I did it, and I remember after feeling liberated, I probably will never watch that again, but I remember that was a big, a really big moment for me. I think I called Sarah, and I called my mom, and I told them what I did, and I was so proud of myself. That was a, a really big um, moment, realizing that I could, do, I could do that. I could watch that and not break. I could see these people who put such fear in my life and be okay afterwards. So um, that was definitely a big healing moment. And then I would say Sarah and I were asked to speak um, again for our church um, for a group of students who ended up having um, a stabbing hap happen at their school the day before we were asked to speak to them. So this had all been planned for months. And um, it was it was clear that that was meant to be, that we were there to be um, comfort to them and show them that after so long, after so many years, it's still hard, but you can do it and you can survive. And we've had a handful of opportunities to share our story and to um, share how we how we have healed and how we've coped and I think doing that and finding it in ourselves to be of help to anyone anyone has been a huge healing um, milestone for both of us I think a couple things um, that helped me were Sarah I think finding finding somebody who understands and although our experiences were very different and our healing was very different she was that positive person and I I didn't get to that place for many years after but always knowing that there was somebody that knew what I was feeling and that I could just cry to or listen to was huge for me and I think on that same note Understanding that a, the grieving process, no matter if you go through the same thing or you're, you know, I think the grieving process for each person is very unique, very different. I remember many times in high school looking at people wondering how they were so happy and how it seemed like they didn't, they weren't affected at all. And why was I the only one that, um, had to go home after we had a fire alarm. Every time that happened, I called my mom and she dropped what she was doing and she came and picked me up because I couldn't finish the day. And I remember looking around me thinking, what is wrong with you people? Like, aren't you feeling this way too? And now looking back 19 years later, I can see that they probably were all hurting inside. But... Um, it's very different how it affects you and how you grieve, and that's okay. It's okay to be to feel broken, to feel scared when you feel like everybody else around you is just perfect. And I think also on that same note, I went on antidepressants, and um, I am still on them 19 years later and have you know, a couple times felt like I was strong enough to not, to not have that, but I am not. And it's okay. It's okay. I feel, I feel fine and happy that I have admitted to myself that I have depression and that I can use that, that is a modern day blessing to help me. Sarah's not on antidepressants and has, hasn't ever been, and that's okay. But that is definitely something that's helped me to know that it's different and um, it's okay to, to use what resources and what people and whatever, whatever it is that helps you, just embrace that and use it for good. I would have liked to tell myself that I, 
that I would be able to accomplish things that I would never think possible in my own life, that I would be able to not only move past this trial, but find joy and happiness in ways that I never would have thought available to me that I could, I think that would empower me to heal more knowing that there was light at the end of the tunnel, that I was going to have a happy and joyful life with people who loved me and that I was not alone in any way in my grief, that even though it was very different from others, um, that it was still grief and it was my own and it was fine. And um, I think that's important too, is that it's okay to grieve. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to have hard moments and it's okay to be angry. And those are all parts of the process, parts of the healing process. And you're going to experience them all, but you're also going to have happiness and joy. And that's okay. Also, it's okay to be happy. That was hard for me for a while. I watched other people, especially Lara struggle so much. I felt that guilt, that survivor's guilt, they call it, that I did not suffer in the same way that she did. And I was not allowed to feel either allowed to feel my pain and grief the way that I did because I did not have those trials the same way that she did, but also that I, it was okay for me to be happy and it was okay for me to find positive things in my life and be optimistic. And that was a good thing. And it helped both of us, I think, mm -hmm. for um, me to be... I think you know. if she was broken too, like I was, it would have been another story. So it definitely was a good thing. It was broken in my own way. She was broken in a hiding way. She didn't, she was really good at being happy, but carrying that burden inside. I let mine show a little bit more. <laughs> and that's okay. We still have to deal with emotions that are scary and that are hard, um, especially as we see our own children go to school and as we kind of have to face those fears over and over again each time there's a new school shooting or, you know, some sort of catastrophe. It brings that uneasiness and that unrest back up, but you learn ways to cope and you will learn ways to uh, be okay. And, and you can learn. I mean, it's not a given thing that you, you will have to put in effort. That's going to be the hard thing is that you will have to work at it and you have to make up your mind that you're going to succeed and that you're going to pull through because you can easily go the other route if you choose. And I've seen people do that and it's not pretty and it's hard and scary and um, but that you absolutely can overcome the trial and you can, you can have a happy and fulfilled life. Also, I think it would have been, and maybe even is now good to, to know that it's not something that you're ever going to get rid of. It's not, it's not a, a hardship or a trial that is just going to go away. It's not. And I think coming when I did my counseling when I was 22 or whatever age I was, I think he focused on that. He said, this is something that you need to learn to live with, not something that you are going to get rid of. And so that has been very helpful, realizing that it's, it's not going to go away. And when these new things happen and these new shootings happen, it does um, come back. But you learn techniques and um, have the ability to, to continue living and being happy. I echo what Laura said. It's going to be a long, long, long road, and that's okay. Um, it does get better. It gets easier. It gets to the point where you can reflect on it and not 
break, break down in tears. Break down and, into tears or shake or, you know, you can overcome the feelings that you have right now. And if there is ever a moment where you feel like you're very alone or you feel like no one understands, we do. And you, I mean, we would be thrilled and happy to be available in any capacity to someone who has gone through something like this. You're gonna be able to use this for good. You're gonna be able to turn this horrible experience into um, a way that you can help other people.